First of all, fantastic to be here for uh, an everything IoT type event. I mean, most of us have been around this sector for a while, you know, have spent most of our time at barbecues explaining what we do all day. So it's good to have a room of people that at least, you know, uh, a good way along that journey. So I'm going to take some time today just to talk about what I do, some of the learnings that we've seen with GE, and, and particularly what we're seeing in this space. Um, and to give you just a flavor, I think, of what are some of the challenges we see in the realities of the industrial side of IoT. Um, so I'm going to start with, with this gentleman. I'm just going to deviate a little bit away from the, the sort of energy sector. But this guy is, is uh, probably not the poster child for digital and IoT, you'd imagine. But this gentleman uh, is an Indonesian farmer. Just before I go any further, is anybody, anybody farmer in the audience, Indonesian farmer, perhaps, just before I get myself into too much trouble? No? Okay, so, so this guy's an Indonesian farmer um, who is a recipient of a solution that one of our partners has put in place using a, a piece of technology that, that we've been building. And Indonesian farms, I don't know if you know much about them, are typically around about three quarters of an acre, pretty small parcels of land. And the Indonesian government will tell you that you need an acre of land to be above the poverty line. So the vast majority of these farmers are really struggling to make ends meet year on year. And so we've been working with uh, a company in Indonesia to help these guys sense their farms very, very cheaply. And what we essentially do is once a week, somebody will walk around the perimeter of the farm and then selected points inside the crops and measure just with a normal phone, some, some basic data, record it in the smartphone, upload it into the cloud, collect that data and feed it back to the farmer. And the farmer uses that information to change the fertilizer, the feed, and the balance of the watering in and around his, his, uh, his plot. And what we're seeing is using that real simple technology, um, sensing, clouds, and basic analytics, that the farmers can improve their yield by about 70%. So all of a sudden, these guys are above the poverty line. They are living a completely different existence. They're able to expand their, their farms, and they're able to do so much more. So a real simple use of IoT, but a real use of IoT. And, and I use it because it's great to see something actually being used in reality. I see so many pilots and so many CIOs particularly who just don't know where to start. And I was a CIO in a prior life, and I think we were all burnt with big projects, you know, taking on these monster projects and just, you know, ending up in, 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 in trouble. And fundamentally, I think with the IoT space, nobody really has that clarity yet as to where we're going. Most CIOs will tell you that big data and IoT are a big part of what they need to do, but the roadmaps aren't clear. So I come across a lot of pilots, a lot of prototypes, but not a lot of mainstream projects. And I think it's incumbent on us, the people in this room, to help the industry really understand what are those key projects, what are those money backs projects now that we can do to get the wins on the board to drive the bigger change going forward. So my first contention today is that there is a massive opportunity out there and we waste most of the opportunity we've got. Customers I talk to in my space, so power, uh, the utilities space, aviation, healthcare, overwhelmingly the first thing we talk about is they say, well, you know, how do I start collecting data? How do I sense data? And my contention is that we actually waste most of the data that's out there. Uh, one of my large mining customers told me that they use half of 1% of the data they collect. And that's the data they collect. And fundamentally, that's because most of the data is locked up in individual systems. Now, we make equipment, and one of the things we did very early on, we said our, 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 our systems, our, our solutions, our products need to be open. So if you take equipment off of our jet engine, all of the data is commonly available, and we'll make it available to, to the operator. Manufacturers need to let go of the data. They need to let go of the proprietary nature of their data and make it more widespread. You know, we were talking, a um, few of us the other day, about you know, Barangaroo. And just thinking about the, the amount of data that a Barangaroo would generate. And really, are we able to bring most of that data together? And the example that somebody threw up was, if you could harness the data coming down in a lift, you know, how many people are actually coming down at a lift at a point in time, the weather outside, no, it was raining, for example, and then know that there wasn't a train or a bus coming, aggregate that data, you'd have an amazing demand-based forecasting system to give to an Uber. People coming, it's raining, there's no train coming, send cars. But we can't do that because that, all of that data is hidden away in the islands. So fundamentally, I think the biggest hurdle we see with our customers is islands of data, it's proprietary data, and this need to bring it all together. And I think when we can do that, 
that's when we see the big wins. It's not necessarily adding extra cost. It's not necessarily adding extra sensors. So the second thing really um, I want to talk about is in, in my world, we sell equipment. And most of our customers, two big things that they search for are reliability and efficiency. And I put up the, the 1989 Jaguar Extra S as probably the pinnacle of both of those two things. Right? I coveted this car for many years. V12 engine spends more time in the mechanics yard and on the road. Right? But you know, fundamentally, we sell equipment, and those are the two things people strive to get. So for example, a jet engine that we put on the side of a plane, fuel efficiency is becoming more and more important. A Qantas wants to fly from Perth to London. They do that because they have flight efficiency services. We help them monitor the engine and drive that engine further than it's ever been planned to, to, to be driven. From a reliability perspective, if there's a problem in flight, that engine is generating about a terabyte of data an hour. And by the time it lands, we can have somebody there to, to fix it on arrival. So the sense of reliability and efficiency are absolutely the two key paramount things in the industrial space. One of my oil and gas customers, for example, has a solution we put in place uh, in their coal, ske coal seam gas wells. Uh, we have a very simple uh, iPad-based solution that their field engineers can carry around that monitors about 20 different data points in and around the wells, and it can give them indications of when the wellhead is going to fail. To the point where we can say, in three days' time, this particular well is going to get clogged. Don't go worry about fixing it today. Don't drive the 500 Ks out to where it is. You don't need to do it today, but you can go tomorrow because it's going to fail the day after. Now, that ability to understand how you change your maintenance and your servicing has enormous amount of value. You know, the parallel is just like us in a car. You know, everyone changes their oil at, you know, or gets their car serviced at 12,000 Ks because that's what it says in the, in the corner. But in reality, everybody's car is fundamentally different. You know, they might come off the line the same, but the way you drive your car might be very different to the way I drive my car. And if you drive your car hard, it might break down at 10,000 Ks and give you a problem. Or if you drive it really well, you might be able to stretch that service out. So getting that balance of reliability and efficiency and how you balance out your servicing is absolutely paramount. So those are the things that, that, that we look for in this space. And where we're seeing the real winners are the customers that are striving, not for the massive increases, but for the 1%. And the 1% right now are those money box projects. I've got a project with a, uh, a company that's hauling iron ore. They buy our locomotives. Um, our locomotives are about a $3 million piece of equipment. And right in the middle, it has two racks. There are 900 sensors in and around the locomotive. It's collecting data from, from the wheels, the bearings, the fuel system, the engine management system, collecting all that data in real time. It's doing a lot of edge processing on the locomotive itself and then it's sending data back up to the cloud depending on what sort of coverage it's got. If it's on satellite, it sends rudimentary data, but once it comes back into the yard, it'll send the rest. The ability for that locomotive to continually monitor itself means that we can drive performance, fuel efficiency around the locomotive, but what you can also stop things like a derailment. One of the biggest issues for any kind of freight operator is derailment. If a train falls over, you've got a big problem. Typically, where you've got single rail tracks, it stops all the other trains behind it. And if you're pulling iron ore, for example, you're losing production because you're not getting that iron ore out to the port. Right? So the ability for us to understand that this particular bearing is overheating and this train is going to fall over within the next 20 minutes allows the, the operator to do something completely different. Do they slow it down? Do they pull into a siding or whatever? So again, small, simple wins, small, simple projects in the beginning. But these are the projects which are the money box projects that are then buying the future for us. And the 1% savings are really all we're striving for today. Um, the slide's got a picture of a pigeon. Um, any, any pigeon fanciers here? This is always an interesting one. I think it's, it's, I love that phrase, pigeon fancier. My, my grandfather was a pigeon fancier, I, I love this. Uh, as was the Queen, Manuel Noriega, and Picasso, just three notable pigeon fanciers. But uh, as a child, I remember sitting with my, my grandfather, and he had a new pigeon. I was probably four or five, new pigeon, and he was going out to race it for the first time. And this bird was 400 pounds in the UK. So this is sizable that investment. And he was going to launch this bird for the first time. And I said to him, how do you know if it's going to go? We were 50 k's away from home. I said, how do you know this bird is going to make it home? And he said, well, we don't. We, uh, firstly, we don't know if it's going to make it home. And then I was this inquisitive child. And so I said, well, you know, how does it do it? You know, how's the... And we went through all the different theories, the magnetic things in its head, and, you know, 
you know, flying around in circles to orient itself. He said, but fundamentally, we don't know. We don't know how that bird makes it home. And it's one of many, many factors. And each bird may work in a different way. And so it, the reason I quote this story was, is we look at the big data space, oftentimes the solutions we put in place feel like that. So we make a, a system called Predix. It's our, um, the way I describe it, it's like iOS for the industrial internet. If you want to build an IoT application in the industrial space, Predix is like an underlying platform. It manages your data ingestion in an industrial space, does all the analytics, and it does the visualization on the back end. Right? And in the middle, there's this big kind of wodge of analytics. And what we typically find is there isn't usually one solution for most of the problems. There's a lot of different analytics that, the, that we use. Because the transfer function as you get into more and more complex data sets starts to get really, really confused. And so what we typically find is the customers will put the data through three or four of these different uh, analytics routines, maybe neural networks, some traditional regression analysis, traditional condition monitoring, and blend the output to get a really good view of what the, what the solution should be. And it kind of feels to me like the pigeon. We don't really always have clarity of what that transfer function is when we get into this big data space. But again, more and more experimentation. I have a, a large team of data scientists that I pull upon. And I think, you know, I have a 13-year-old son. I've said to him, be a data scientist. You know, there's so much money in that and so much in short supply. We can't get enough data scientists. And fundamentally, the ability for data scientists to take that analytic output, but blend it with almost a physics reality is really important. Now, we, we've been making jet engines for 50, 60 years. We've got people that understand the hardware. If I can get a great data scientist and somebody who understands the hardware and put the two together, we've got a real winning combination. And it's that balance of physics and analytics which is really, really driving the change. So my overall message here is, you know, again, start something. Let's try these projects. It's not necessarily the end game that we have to reach for. Everyone's looking for that, that you know, 30, 40, 50 million dollar project, when in reality, it's baby steps right now. The, the hype, the media, the consumer side of IoT is racing along at breakneck speed, but the industrial world is somewhat of a laggard in this space. So, and then just to kind of just wrap this up, you know, I, I, I think you know, your comments earlier on are absolutely true. Australia's in an amazing place. If you think about our marketplace for IoT, I typically look at you know, two quite distinct markets I, I look after in Asia region. I've got customers in developing nations where we're putting in new infrastructure. You put in a new oil environment, you put in a new grid, new power station. We sensorize those from the very beginning. And then we've got the developed nations, and I put Australia in that category, where we're trying to squeeze you know, the most out of what we've got. You know, whether it's optimizing a mine site, whether it's optimizing the grid, whether it's looking to get a gas turbine to perform better. Fundamentally, our ability to sensorize, to analyze, and optimize is absolutely critical. And Australia has always had an amazing history of innovation. We have a real need as we want to remain competitive in this space. So I think all of the conditions are right for us to be incredibly successful, not only for our domestic use, but to also export to, to the broader world. So excited to be here. Thanks for the time. It's going to be a good panel discussion this afternoon. So thank you very much.